Well, good evening, everybody, and good evening to those of you who are joining us online tonight. We're going to begin with a word of prayer and then continue with our study of the Gospel of John, picking up where we had left off the last time, which was uh, three weeks ago, right? So let, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we honor you. We, we, we simply adore you. You are the God of the universe, and yet you know each of us better than we know ourselves, and you are near to us, and for that we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for the way you reveal yourself in every generation. We praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ, and, and thank you for his, his amazing teaching, his life of perfect obedience, his willing sacrifice on the cross for all of us, his resurrection from the grave, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and for his imminent return. We pray this evening, Lord, that we may hear your voice clearly as you speak to us here in the Gospel of John. May your Holy Spirit come upon us in power. May we, we be filled with joy and, and just deep devotion toward you. And may the words of Jesus speak into our very souls tonight, drawing us into your presence, drawing us closer to you, filling us with power and strength to carry out the work you've given us to do in these last days. We pray that in the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah of Israel, the hope of the nations, and our coming King. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, pick up where we had left off last time, and since it's been a few weeks, thank you, by the way, for your patience in, in waiting while uh, we spent time with our, our grandkids and our kids over the uh, the last week, and then, of course, the week before was Fourth of July week, and, you know, everything kind of, the, the cities empty out, and uh, so we, we're going to be picking up where we had left off three weeks ago. We're in John chapter 5, and what I'd like to do this evening is pick up at verse 19. That's a little earlier than where we had left off last time, but uh, we weren't able to uh, to do the stuff that I'd like to, to concentrate on this evening, the last time we met. And just to kind of give you a reminder of where we are and what has gone on, we're in the middle of the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus has just come to the city of Jerusalem once again. John, of course, is the only one of the New Testament authors, uh, only one of the Gospel authors, I should say, who, who talks about the, the regular visits of Jesus to the city of Jerusalem during the time of the great festivals, the feasts of the Lord, as they're called in the, the Torah, in the, the uh, books of Moses. And John mentions in considerable detail Jesus coming at various and sundry of those festivals. In chapter 5, he comes at a one of the Jewish feasts, is what John tells us. And we're not told which one of those festivals it is. Some people have suggested that it is Passover. Others have suggested tabernacles. But some of the latest research would indicate that the very subjects that Jesus is talking about are, are subjects that were commonly spoken of at the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, as it's called in the, the Torah. And uh, as is so often the case in the Gospel of John, the words that Jesus speaks in this Gospel are often uniquely tailored to the, the sections of scripture that were concentrated on at the various Jewish festivals. And uh, at Rosh Hashanah, New Year, the emphasis is on repentance, on the need to turn back to God, to believe in him. And that is exactly what comes up in John chapter 5, because Jesus goes to one man at the pool of Bethesda. Last time we had talked about the fact that that pool of Bethesda may well have been a pagan hospital dedicated to the the uh, pagan god Asclepius. And uh, Jesus does not heal a large number of people. Elsewhere in the Gospels, you know, people will bring all of the sick. They will bring the lame and the blind to Jesus. They'll bring those who are demon-possessed, and he will heal them all. But in this instance, he only goes to one man, an Israelite, who is near the pool, who has been lame for 38 years. Jesus heals him, tells him to pick up his mat and walk home, and it's the Sabbath day. 
the, the man is confronted by the religious leaders and they say, why are you carrying your mat on the Sabbath? That's not allowed. Now, the Old Testament does not forbid you to carry your mat on the Sabbath. This is a law that had been developed by the traditions of the Jewish people, the traditions of the elders, they were called. And the intent was to, to keep anyone from violating God's law by establishing, basically, establishing a hedge around the law. Uh, additional things. Don't do this so that you won't, won't possibly do such and such. And when the man is questioned, who was it who healed you? He says, I don't know. Later, Jesus meets him in the temple and, and talks to him and says, stop sinning. And that's uh, verse 14 of, of John 5. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. He's calling him to repentance. And in all likelihood, the call to repentance is because this guy has apparently been trusting others rather than the living God to bring healing to him. Jesus is saying, turn away from the old way and follow the living God and him alone. And so it's at that point now that we pick up this evening. And uh, as we, we study this evening, what we're going to see is that Jesus is confronted once again by the religious leadership in Jerusalem. And they're challenging him. How dare you do the things that you're doing? And how dare you say the things that you are saying? Jesus' response to that is so typically Jesus. He doesn't apologize. He doesn't back away. He just simply comes on even stronger. And he says, here's what this is all about. And it's there that we pick up verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, or in Greek, amen, amen. <laughs> amen, amen, I tell you. The son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. And this is in response, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? And Jesus is saying, I'm only doing what my father is doing because the son only does what the father does. Do you realize how radical this is? And, and all that will follow in the text here in John chapter 5, it, it is radical stuff. Jesus is equating himself with the Father. Uh, in, in Jewish culture in the first century, uh, it, people were very reluctant to talk about God as Father. There are a few times when God is called Father in the Old Testament, the Father of his people, the Father of Israel. But they are limited numbers of times. And, and in Jewish culture in the first century, uh, people would sometimes refer to God being the father of us all. But Jesus, Jesus tears up all the rule books. He says he's my father, <laughs> my father. And uh, not only is he my father, Jesus is saying, I do what he does. And I only do what he does. And I only say what he says. Th these are words that would have caused the religious authorities to just go absolutely bonkers. That, that's not a biblical word, by the way. But uh, I, the, the picture that comes to my mind, if, if you remember some of the old cartoons in, in the... Uh, uh, in the days before cartoons had to become very socially acceptable, uh, the cartoon characters who got upset often steam would come out of their ears and their heads would spin. If you remember some of those old cartoons, I, I really believe that's the equivalent of what the religious authorities were doing as they're listening to Jesus. And Jesus just doesn't stop there. Instead, what follows in verses 19 to 30 is one of the most dramatic and powerful examples of Jesus declaration about his identity, his power, his authority, and, and what he has come to do and what he will return to do. No one can look at this with open eyes and not see that he is claiming not only to be Israel's Messiah, but he is claiming to be the very the, the very God of the universe who has come into human flesh. I, I mean, it, it is dramatic stuff. And keep in mind, we're, we're less than a quarter of a way through the Gospel of John. And already we are seeing this over and over again. John is, is he puts together the teachings of Jesus and, and a few specific events from Jesus' ministry. John is making it so clear who Jesus is. He is not just a great teacher. He is not simply a wonderful prophet. He is not merely a miracle worker. He is the living God 
come down to earth, who has taken on human flesh to give his life for us all and to give us life forever through faith in him. There's something else, however, that happens here in this section of the Gospel of John, and that is a very unique structure. Uh, it's called a chiastic structure. It is something that we see, uh, for instance, in some of the Apostle Paul's writings, but also in the Hebrew scriptures. And, and keep in mind, this structure is something that Jesus is doing on the spur of the moment. Now, I, I mean, this is, this is amazing stuff. A chiastic structure, you basically repeat uh, over and again, certain fundamental truths. And, and you do it by, uh, at the beginning, for instance here, A1, the Son does what the Father does. And then B1, the Father and the Son give life to the dead. C1, the Father gives judgment to the Son. Then you get to the middle, verses 24 and 25. Jesus talks that they will hear and believe, and then they will hear and live. And then he goes back to the Father makes the Son the life giver. And then all the dead will rise and the son judges as the father does. And you see this, this pattern of one thing spoken at the beginning and then repeated at the end, another thing spoken in second place and then repeated second to last. It, it is an incredibly complex and, and brilliant structure, but I think it's important to remember Jesus is doing this on the spur of the moment. You know, these are words that he is speaking in the moment, and he is just emphasizing this in such a powerful and dramatic way. And we need to see that because this means these are serious, important, life-changing truths. And, and once you see that structure, you stand back and say, well, this guy is brilliant. And, and yes, he is. And there's a reason for that. He's God, <laughs> and God is brilliant. <laughs> he, you know, he is the greatest mind in the universe and far beyond our ability to comprehend. And we, we need to have that kind of holy reverence before him. And uh, Jesus is just, he is, he is going to make heads spin here. And we really need to deeply appreciate what he's saying. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the rest of his teaching. He starts out, amen, amen, or very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what, the, what he sees the father doing. And the, the obvious implication is the father is still working even though it's the Sabbath. And Jesus is saying, so I'm working too. And God gives life, God gives healing. That's what I'm doing. He goes on, verse 20, for the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. Jesus' miracles, Jesus' signs that he performs are intended both to validate his identity and also to cause people to realize God has appeared. The very, thing, the, the very things, rather, the great Hebrew prophets had predicted are now being fulfilled by Jesus himself. The prophets had said that when Messiah comes, the, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will be raised, good news will be preached to the poor, and Jesus is doing all of those things. And in effect, what he's telling the religious leaders who are upset because he's healed a man who has been lame for 38 years, what he's saying to them is, you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> you know, this, this is just a preview of what is to come and what we will see then in the coming chapters of the Gospel of John, in the next 16 chapters, remarkable things as Jesus does things that no one has ever done before and uh, they, they cause us to realize God has come down and everything the prophets have spoken that, that is now being fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. So he says, you'll see even greater things than this and you will be amazed. I, I don't know about you, but I want to live in continuous amazement at what God is doing and what God has done. Because what Jesus said, I only do what the Father is doing. The Father is still doing things and Jesus is still doing things. And you and I don't want to miss those. 
The Christian faith is not merely a matter of knowing certain truths and believing that certain incidents happened long ago. It's all about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding that God is near. He is near to all those who call upon him, to all who call on him in truth, as the psalmist tells us. Jesus is saying, you haven't seen anything yet. And he goes on. Verse 21. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Whoa! Uh, and, and again, I think it's so important for us to really focus in on these verses and, and to internalize what Jesus is saying. You know, he says, first of all, the father raises the dead, verse 21. That is something that the Jewish people believed. It is something that Orthodox Jews believe today. They believe that when Messiah comes, he is going to raise the dead. And uh, Jesus is saying, the father raises the dead, and just as he does that, He's given the authority to his son, you know. And then he goes on. The father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to his son. Now, we talked about that a few weeks ago. At the beginning of the Gospel of John, in John chapter 3, it says, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. When Jesus came the first time, his mission was salvation. He did not come to judge. He came to save and to redeem. When he returns, he will come to judge. And Jesus is already looking ahead to that. What we have here in this section from verses 19 to 30 is Jesus talking not only about the present, in other words, first century, but talking also about the future, his return, his imminent return. And he is saying, the Father has entrusted to the Son the authority to judge. That, you know... This is the one that the prophet Daniel saw. Daniel chapter 7. He saw one like a son of man to whom was given authority over the nations and all nations would worship him and he would stand in judgment over them. Jesus is saying, that's who I am. You know, he, he, again, everything we have here, when Jesus speaks, he speaks in fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament. He's not making new things. He's not making anything up. He is instead fulfilling what has already been stated is going to happen. And he is saying, those things point to me. He goes on and he says, why? So that all, verse 28, or verse 23 rather, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, the Bible clearly says, you shall worship God and him alone, no other gods. You know, uh, we are to worship God and none other. But Jesus says, you will honor the son as you honor the father. He is either the most arrogant and, uh, how do I put this, the most arrogant and... Uh, idolatrous individual or he is who he claimed to be he is the living God come down to earth I opt for option B he is who he claims to be but these are dramatic words and and you you have to wonder how did the religious hierarchy deal with that we know later on in the Gospel of John they want to kill him this guy's making himself equal with God but he does not back off he, he just, he lays it right out on the line. He says, you know, if you honor the Father, then you need to honor the Son. And if you don't honor the Son, you do not honor the Father. Jesus is making it very clear that everything depends on a relationship with him. And by the way, that is not just theology. That is practical daily truth. You and I need to come to grips with the fact that the Lord Jesus is calling us to recognize that he is not only our Savior, he is our Lord, 
And we are to bow before him in reverence, to serve him with joy, and, and to seek to do everything he has commanded us. Not to earn his love. His love is unconditional and it's been poured out. Not to earn our forgiveness. Our forgiveness was earned at the cross and at the empty tomb. But rather in response to what God has done, and in response to who Jesus is, we willingly surrender ourselves to him and we honor the Son just as we honor the Father. Okay, verse 24. Now we come to a section, verses 24 and 25, and then moving on to verse 28. Uh, some very powerful teaching of Jesus and also some powerful teaching of Jesus that may well help us understand the most difficult and controversial chapter in all of the New Testament and arguably in all of the Bible, and that's Revelation chapter 20. So here we go. We're going to first take a look at John 5, verses 24 and 25 and following, and then we'll go to Revelation 20 and try to put all those pieces together, okay? But uh, this is what Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, or amen I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And again, don't read over that. This is not flyover country. What Jesus is saying is, if you believe in him and believe the one who sent him, you know, the living God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if you believe him and trust him, then you and I, by faith, have already gone from death to life. Now, that in some sense seems counterintuitive because our, you know, our, our mind, our, our experience, our, our vision, looking in the mirror, things like that, they all tell us we're dying. And, and that's not a pleasant thing to talk about, but it's true. You know, we're getting older. Having just spent time with our, our kids and grandkids, I, I mean, wonderful time, but you see how quickly the years go by. And I look at these kids, you know, our, our oldest grandson who, you know, it seems like just yesterday he was a little babe in arms and now he's looking me in the eye. And I think, how did this happen so quickly? I look in the mirror and I say, how did that happen so quickly? You know, the, the hair is getting more and more platinum blonde and, and the wrinkles are getting deeper and, and you know, things are not where they used to be. <laughs> it, we're, 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 we're aging. We're, we're dying. After 21, it's all downhill, you know. But for us who believe, for us who know the Lord Jesus, we are already experiencing eternal life. Jesus is saying, everyone who believes in him and believes in the Father who sent him has already passed from death to life. And basically what it means is you and I have gone from being the living dead, zombies. We, we've gone from being zombies to people who have deathless living. Even though, you know, if Jesus doesn't return first, all of us are going to die. But the fact of the matter is, by faith in him, you and I already have eternal life. And that's our future. And that's why we don't have to fear death. You know, we may worry about, well, what's it going to feel like or, you know, how long is it going to take and, and all of those other concerns. But the fact of the matter is, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've repented and received him as Savior and Lord, you have already gone from death to life. And, and that is the way Jesus talks throughout this gospel. Whoever believes in him has already gone from death to life. Before we knew him, we were the living dead. Some of you are individuals who have known the Lord Jesus all your life. You can never remember a time when you didn't know him. Others of you are people who came to know him later on in life. Those of you who came to know him later on in life, you know what it was like when you, when you finally realized who he is and what this means and that he did this for you and for me. 
And at that point, you say, oh my, all of a sudden, it all makes sense. All of a sudden, you know, the, the things that used to be so important, I realize they are not the most important things at all. And the most important thing is knowing him, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing his love and forgiveness, knowing the power of his resurrection, knowing the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that I am going to be raised at the end of days, that I'm, I live forever, and that that has begun right now. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, anyone who hears his word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. It's a promise. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to talk to people in many situations and in many settings, uh, sometimes in their homes, sometimes uh, you know, in, in open public areas, sometimes in my office, sometimes preaching and teaching and so forth, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes with groups of individuals. One of the things that I've seen over and again as individuals uh, wrestle with the scriptures and wrestle with the Lord Jesus is people will sometimes say, well, I, I hope I'll be with the Lord forever, but I just don't know. And what Jesus is saying is you can know because he keeps his word. And if you believe him and trust him, then you can know that you have eternal life. In fact, John will, uh, will write at a later date, and say, written these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. He says that in his first epistle, his first letter. These things are written so that you may know that you have eternal life. That is what Jesus promised. Anyone who believes and trusts in him has already gone from death to life. And then he takes it one step further. And here now, it's going to be very important that you notice the tenses as Jesus speaks. He'll speak in present tense. And then he will speak in future tense. And it's very important to, to, to recognize that and reflect on it. And so verse 25, very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come. So the, the time is coming and it's already here. And Jesus is speaking somewhere circa 30 AD. Time is coming and it's already come. What? It's coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, what is Jesus referring to when he talks about the dead will hear? Some people look at that and say, well, uh, Lazarus, you know, uh, some months after this, Jesus will go to the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus and, and he will call Lazarus by name. Lazarus, come forth. His sisters will be absolutely astonished. Jesus says to them, roll away the stone from the tomb. And the answer is, oh Lord, you know, it's been four days since he died. He, he smells. I love the way the King James Version of the Bible translates that, by the way. It says, he stinketh. <laughs> it's, it's been four days. He stinketh. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus does. Some say that's what this is referring to. I don't believe that to be the only example of what he's talking about. He's talking about the time has already come. It's already here. The dead hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear live. What it's saying is, before you or I or any other human being knows the living God through Jesus Christ, we are spiritually dead. And it is only when we come to faith in him that we truly begin to live. The Apostle Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 2. We were dead in trespasses. You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you used to walk when we followed the prince power of the air. But, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying the time is already here. People who are spiritually dead hear the voice of the Son of God and believe. And when they do, they have life. And uh, that's what God desires for every one of us. God's will, the will of the Father is that every human being come to know him and believe in him. God would have all men to be saved, the New Testament says, and come to a knowledge of the truth. Or God would have all people to be saved would be a better way to translate that today and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And Jesus is saying, those who believe in him, the time has come. When they hear and believe, they have life. He goes on. 
Verse 26, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Again, you know, these are amazing words. He is saying he is the living God come down. And uh, you and I are called to hear his voice and to follow him. And then he says this, verse 28, or verse 27, he's given, this, he's given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Then verse 28, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming, note that, not has already come, but is coming. A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. What Jesus is saying is the very thing that the prophet Daniel was told and predicted. And keep in mind, when Jesus speaks, he always speaks in fulfillment of the scriptures. And what we have here is something the prophet Daniel had predicted hundreds of years earlier. If you turn in your Bibles for just a second to the, the book of Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, we see something that is almost word for word what Jesus says here. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, the prophet Daniel writes and says, this is what he has heard from God. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus is saying the same thing. He is saying the time is coming when those who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and, and they will be raised. Some to everlasting life, those who have trusted, believed and followed him, others to everlasting judgment and contempt. And uh, he's saying this is what awaits us. Now, please note, he's talking about a resurrection that occurs when we believe, going from death to life, and a resurrection that will occur at the end of time. That is something that the scriptures unanimously teach, that we are raised to life through faith in Christ, and that we will be raised at the last day. What we have here in John chapter 5, though, is something written down by Jesus' best friend. And it may well be the clue and the key to understanding the most difficult and controversial chapter in all of the Bible, and that's Revelation 20. And so what I'd like to do right now is hang on to uh, John chapter 5 and uh, then flip over to Revelation chapter 20, where we read these words. I'm going to start at verse 1. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And then it goes on to talk about what happens as the, the devil at the end of days is thrown into the lake of fire. And we're told, uh, chapter 20, verse 14, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And you look at all of that, and the normal reaction of people reading that is, 
whoa, what does this mean? You know, and we've got a mention of a first resurrection and a second death. And the implication is if there's a first resurrection, then there's also a second resurrection. And if there's a second death, then there's also a first death. What in the world are they? It is no wonder that this chapter has been the most controversial and most debated chapter of the New Testament. It is arguably the most difficult chapter in all of the Bible. How do you put the pieces together? I believe that John chapter 5 may well give us deep insight into how to fit these pieces together. As I say that, I want to emphasize it is absolutely essential for us to approach this with a spirit of humility, reverence of God, and with the understanding there are some things that are clear and have been clearly revealed. There are other things that God has not yet shown us. And I believe we need to approach these things in holy awe. I recognize that Christians throughout the ages have had widely differing understandings of Revelation 20 and specifically widely different understandings of the millennium, the thousand years. By the way, the millennium, the thousand year reign is only mentioned in all of the Bible. It is only mentioned here in Revelation 20. But it is significant, I believe, that this talk about two resurrections and first and second death does seem to mirror what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 5, when he talks about those who are now dead will be raised by faith in him to life. And at the end of time, he will raise the dead from their graves and give eternal life to those who believe. You really do tend to see the, the whole notion of first and second resurrection, first death, second death, which is judgment of those who do not believe in the Lord. What I'd like to do in, in the time that we have remaining here and before we go any further in John 5 is just reflect on some of this this morning. I'll just be really upfront with you. I had initially intended to cover far more material today than, than, I, than we're going to do. But in the morning class, uh, a series of questions were raised. They were great questions. And uh, we ended up going off in a, a direction that I had not intended to go in, but I think it was a great direction. And uh, the, there was a lot of laughter this morning uh, as we got to the end of class, I looked at everybody and I said, how in the world are we going to do the same thing in the evening class that we did in the morning class? And we all, we all laughed about that. Uh, I said, well, I'll tell you what, as we end with prayer, let's pray that God will make that very clear. And you know what he did? I, th this is just such a neat thing. I, I love it when God does these kinds of things. Um, we, we finished the prayer and I started talking with a few people after class and all of a sudden I knew what we were supposed to do tonight and I realized it was already prepared. Uh, a couple of months ago, I had gone to a gathering of pastors of a wide number of denominations and Pastor Phil was there, Bob Johnson was there and uh, it, it was a really neat setting because you had individuals from a, a variety of denominations, all dedicated followers of Jesus. But we had very differing views on the last days and end times and we were supposed to talk about those things together and I had been asked to be one of the speakers for that and had prepared a, a presentation to, to give to fellow pastors and, and church leaders and, and uh, dedicated Christian lay people. It, it was a wonderful time. Usually when you have something like this where you've got people all over the road map, it can be tense. This gathering was not like that. There was just a, a really great spirit, a collegial spirit, a humility before God and, and uh, cutting one another plenty of slack. But on the morning when I woke up, the morning I was supposed to speak, I'd already prepared a series of, of, of uh, teachings and had a number of slides ready for it. And I was told when I woke up I was not to give that. I was to do something different. And so, okay, Lord, that's what I'll do. Had forgotten all about that. And this morning as we were praying and then talking afterwards, all of a sudden I remembered that thing and realized that it, 
they, these are slides that are talking about the very thing we ended up talking about this morning as a result of the questions. And so I've just changed the colors of the slides so they match the colors of the things that we've seen so far. And it's on that note, we're going to take a look at how do we understand what the Bible says about first and second resurrection, first and second death. What does the end look like? Where is this all going to go? I, I want to stress that believers throughout the ages have had widely divergent opinions. I am absolutely convinced that the day will come when we will understand everything. I also am absolutely convinced that we don't yet. <laughs> and you know, the, the, the Old Testament as well as the New tell us to be humble before God, to, to be kind to one another, to search the things of God, to listen to the Spirit of God. But there are some things that God has not yet fully revealed. I know that the rabbis before the time of Jesus, they searched the scriptures to, to understand what it would be like when Messiah came. And, and they, they were brilliant. Uh, they, many of the rabbis understood that the, the Hebrew scriptures are talking about a Messiah who is going to reign in power and all the nations will bow before him. At the same time, they recognize the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures say that Messiah is going to suffer and, and will be beaten and, and killed. And, and the rabbis looked at that and said, how can this be? Many of them ended up saying, well, they're going to, there will be two messiahs, one who will be a suffering messiah, another who will be a reigning messiah, one who will be the, the messiah, Mashiach, Ben Yosef, the Messiah son of Joseph, who like Joseph in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, uh, suffers at the hand of his brothers. And another, Mashiach Ben Dawid, Messiah son of David, who will be a glorious king, who will reign over all things. And, and they looked at the scriptures and said, yep, I guess they're going to be two messiahs. They came so close. In reality, it's one messiah and two comings. I believe we need to have humility as we look at what the New Testament teaches as well as the Old and understand that God has given us what we need to know, but there are some things that we just don't understand in, in fullness and probably won't until either everything comes together at the end or the Lord has returned. But here is the way people have traditionally looked at, at the teaching of Revelation 20 and the rest of Scripture on the last days. Four different views, widely held. The first is what's known as historic premillennialism. This is the view that was most widely held by the earliest Christians whose writings have survived. Uh, we, we cannot we cannot authoritatively say that this was the view of all the early believers. In fact, to the contrary, we have witness from early, early Christian authors uh, who tell us that others had different views and they are still solid followers. But the uh, historic premillennialism, premillennialism means before the millennium. That is one of the views and we're going to look at what that means. A second view is a view known as postmillennialism, after the millennium or after the thousand years. A third view, amillennialism, which literally means no millennium, but that's not what it says. And again, we'll, we'll explore this in just a few moments. And the final view that has become very popular today and, and really first came to, to, into prominence in the early 1800s is a view known as dispensational premillennialism. That is the view that is most widely held in Western Christian circles today. It is the view that is usually expressed in much popular Christian literature, things like, uh, well, classics like Late Great Planet Earth, the Left Behind series, and so forth. Those are the four views that have been widely held uh, by the, the Christian community from the time of Jesus to the present. And uh, here's how you break them down. Historic premillennialism basically says the following, that there will be a missionary age. 
uh, what Jesus talked about in his great commission when he said, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. The gospel will be shared throughout the world. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout all the nations as a testimony and then the end will come. Historic premillennialism says you have that missionary age and then Jesus returns. When he returns, according to historic premillennialism, he will reign on the earth for a thousand years. Uh, we know from the book of Acts, when Jesus ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives, uh, he, he is received by a cloud. And keep in mind, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, as God led the children of Israel through the wilderness, how did he lead them? pillar of cloud by day when the tabernacle was built and dedicated. What happened? The cloud comes down and God is saying, I'm dwelling with my people. And he leads them by that cloud then for the rest of their wandering years. Jesus is received into the cloud from the Mount of Olives. And the disciples are staring at the sky and gawking, you know, wow. <laughs> Mouths hanging wide open. Suddenly, two men appear in white, angels. And they say, men of Galilee, why are you staring into the sky? This same Jesus will return in like manner. He's coming back in the same way you saw him go. Uh, by the way, the Hebrew scriptures say that Messiah is going to reveal himself on the Mount of Olives. The New Testament says when he comes back, he's coming back the same way. And the implication is he's coming right back to the Mount of Olives. In fact, the book of Revelation says every eye will see him. Now, in previous generations, many individuals, many believers, and lots of skeptics looked at that and said, how can that be? How can every eye see him when he returns? If he's coming back the way he left to the Mount of Olives, just like we saw him, the disciples saw him go, if he comes back, how can every eye see him? You realize you and I in our lifetimes have at least gotten a glimpse of how that could happen. You know, previous generations, there, there was no way that every eye could see. I, I mean, it's just people in a narrow radius around the Mount of Olives who would see what was going on. But now, now you can watch the World Cup in real time. And, and you can see the, uh, the, the, the demonstrations and the celebration in Paris. You know, and, and people all over the world, hundreds of millions, billions of people can see it. When major events take place, literally billions of people can be watching it in real time. The Bible anticipated that by hundreds and hundreds of years. Every eye will see him. Now, I don't know if we'll all be watching our TV sets when Jesus comes back. Maybe it'll be holograms by that time. I, you know, I really don't know. What I do know is you can trust God's word and you can trust what he says. And, and so, according to historic premillennialism, he returns and sets up reign on the earth. Uh, the premillennialist looks at Revelation 20 and says they will reign with him. And the view was and has been widely held that he reigns for a thousand years. And at the end of that time, the devil is loosed for a little while. It's sometimes called Satan's little season. And then comes the final judgment and the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. That is historic premillennialism. It has been widely held by some of the greatest believers, some of the greatest Christian scholars, and, and some of the most devoted followers of Jesus for many, many centuries. It is still held by many devout believers today. The second view is a view known as postmillennialism. And Post-millennialism, again, after the millennium, the implication is Jesus returns after the millennium. Millennium, Post-millennialism, historic post-millennialism, which has been held by many, many wonderful Christian people, including some incredibly influential American believers. Um, I, I think of an individual, uh, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God, did, how many of you had to read that in high school? Jonathan Edwards' amazing sermon, 
that has become a, a, an American classic. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was an individual whom God used to bring about one of the greatest revivals in American history, what's known as the Great Awakening. He and many others. Jonathan Edwards, brilliant man, a, a dedicated follower of Jesus, uh, a, a preacher who had great influence. By the way, was apparently not a particularly dynamic preacher. Uh, eyewitnesses say that he read his messages and, and you know, he... he set him in a pretty common tone of voice. You know. But God used him in a mighty way. Jonathan Edwards was a post-millennialist. And uh, he held that there would be a missionary age where the gospel would be spread, and that as the gospel is spread around the world, people's lives are dramatically changed, and the world will get better and better. And the post-millennialist would say that as more and more people become followers of Jesus, as greater numbers of believers are, are brought into the faith, that the world's conditions will approve. Post-millennialism was very popular in the early 1900s because what the world had experienced was great missionary fervor in the 1800s as the gospel spread to China, to South Asia, to India, to the, the Pacific Islands, and headhunters become followers of Jesus and individuals who love is just flowing from their lives. And people said, wow, look at what's happening. And then they saw tremendous increases in technology, uh, diseases being conquered for the first time in millennia, uh, tremendous, tremendous jumps in, in knowledge and wisdom. They said, wow, the world's getting better and better. Then World War I came, and Christian countries went to war with one another in the most brutal struggle the world had ever witnessed until 20 years later when World War II eclipsed World War I by many degrees. But post-millennialism says at the end of a time when the world gets better and better, the devil will be let loose for a little while, Jesus returns, the judgment occurs, and God brings in a new heaven and a new earth. The third view, amillennialism, says there will be a missionary age, and during that time, believers who have come to know the living God and who die before Jesus returns, they, they will reign with him in heaven. And uh, Revelation 20 talks about those who have been beheaded because of their testimony about Christ. And the a millennialist says those believers who have died with the Lord are loved ones who have died believing in the Lord Jesus. They are reigning with him now. They are with Christ. And the a millennialist says that millennium is taking place even as we speak. At the end of time, the devil is let loose for a little bit. And it's not that he's not active now, but he can no longer deceive the nations. And then Jesus returns judgment occurs, God establishes a new heaven and a new earth. I look at all three of those views, historic premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism, and I can make some strong biblical arguments for every one of them. And I know people who hold to or have held to those views and are dedicated followers of Jesus. The same can be said for the fourth view, dispensational premillennialism. This is the most complicated of the, uh, of the views, and uh, yet it is the one that is widely held, especially in Western culture today. And it maintains that there will be this missionary age where the gospel spreads throughout the world, but then Jesus will return in a secret coming to rapture believers and take them out before the great tribulation occurs. Um, according to dispensational premillennialism, which is a relatively recent view, uh, what happens is Jesus returns and seizes up the believers. It, it's something that is spoken of in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where we are told that we who are still alive and are left at the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have died, who have fallen asleep. Instead, it says, we will be caught up within the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Dispensational premillennialists say that happens before the time of great tribulation and final judgment. And according to them, 
Then at the end of seven years, Jesus returns. He establishes a kingdom on earth. The devil is released at the end of the thousand years for a little while. Then comes the final judgment and the new heavens and the new earth. I personally believe this fourth view is the weakest of the four, but it is the one that is most widely held today. So often we concentrate though on the differences among these views and among Christians who hold them. I believe there is real benefit in looking at the similarities because you see what is often lost in the debate is the fact that we have so much in common and, and here are the commonalities. First of all, everyone holding to these multiple views maintains there is a missionary age. Everyone holding to these four views says there will be a great tribulation. Everyone holding to these views says there will be a rapture. The dispensational millennial, premillennialist says the rapture occurs before the final coming of Jesus. The others say the rapture occurs when he, he comes. And all of them maintain there is a millennium. All of them say there will be a physical return of Jesus to earth. All of them say the dead are going to be raised at the end of time. And all of them say there will be a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, that's a lot to have in common, isn't it? But it's so typically human that we focus in on the things we differ with one another on rather than the things we agree on. And uh, I believe there is great benefit in the people of God simply saying, I will accept what the scriptures say. And in the things that I don't fully understand, I'll just admit that uh, personally, I believe that a lot of things are going to end up making a lot of sense when Jesus returns. And I believe we're going to be like the, the early disciples who after his resurrection, all of a sudden they say, whoa, it's been there all along. How did we miss that? I, I, I believe in, in a very real sense that's going to happen for us. We know he's coming back. We know the dead are going to be raised. We know that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And how all the pieces fit together? Well, God knows, and I believe we just need to approach this with a humble spirit. That was one of the things that especially, especially ministered to me a couple of months ago when we were together with a whole host of other, other believers and leaders. This, this spirit of gentleness and kindness, strong opinions, but we follow the same Lord, we believe the same scriptures, we will trust the same Holy Spirit, and we will... We will simply honor one another as brothers and sisters, and we will wait for the coming of the Lord. Uh, another way of putting it is Jesus said, he said, no one knows the day of his coming, not even the Son, only the Father. Now that was true before his death and resurrection. He's now at the Father's right hand. That's what the scripture says. He knows everything. But if Jesus didn't know, then we need to have a little bit of humility as well. Let's be honest. Humility is what God desires. And what is the original sin? It's pride. I want to be like God. I want to make my own rules. I want to make my own judgments. And what God is saying is, love mercy, act justly, walk humbly before the Lord your God. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. I believe we need to be humble before God as we look at these words. But I also believe that what we have in uh, John 5 may well help us understand this whole notion of first resurrection, second death, and then the implied second resurrection and first death. John chapter 5, verse 25 says, The time has come, Jesus says. It's already here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and will live. The first resurrection is when we go from being the living dead, the zombies, to those who already have eternal life by faith in Christ. That's the first resurrection. When you and I came to know the Lord Jesus, we went from death to life. And uh, we, we, are, we are already experiencing the first taste of eternity. 
And the day is coming when we will experience it in full and it's going to be glorious and it will be beyond anything you or I can even conceive. That's what the Bible tells us. What, what no one has seen, what the mind of man has not understood, that's what God has prepared for his elect. The second resurrection, well, the second resurrection is when the dead are raised. What is talked about in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, the day is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and be raised, some to life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. The first death is unbelief. You know, when, when we are dead in our trespasses and sins, to quote the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, uh, that's the first death. The second death is hell itself. For those who do not repent and believe on the Son, for those who do not honor the Son as they honor the Father, that is the second death. And uh, I, I find it significant that the very individual who wrote down the words of Jesus in John chapter 5 is the same individual who wrote down the revelation of Jesus in Revelation chapter 20. And uh, as a result, I, I think you can make a very strong case that these words really do help us sort through the most complicated chapter in all of the Bible. Well, on that note, let's go back to uh, John chapter 5 and finish up in the time that we have remaining. Uh, verse 30, Jesus says, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And then Jesus continues to talk to the religious authorities. And he says, If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. Keep in mind, in the Torah, we are told that it is only on the testimony of two or more witnesses that a matter can be established. Jesus' opponents are saying, how dare you brag about who you are? And Jesus is saying, I'm not just testifying about myself. There are others who testify about me. And the first the first is John the Baptist. And so he says, verse uh, 32, there is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, meaning John the Baptist, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave life, and you chose for a time to enjoy his life, his light. Remember, John is the first one who says, look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John says, I saw the Spirit come down on him. John says, there's one coming after me who is so far beyond me that I'm not even fit to untie his sandals. I baptize with water, but he is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And Jesus is saying, John testified about me. But there's more. Verse 36, I have testimony weightier than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. In other words, it's not just what Jesus says about himself. It is not just what John says about Jesus. It is the works, the signs that Jesus does. We've already seen some dramatic signs here in the Gospel of John. As Jesus does remarkable things, as he heals here on this festival of the Jews a lame man who's been lame for 38 years. Jesus is saying, the works that I do, they testify that I am the one the Father has sent. And as we go on in the Gospel of John, we will see Jesus doing things that no other human being has ever done. He says, verse 37, And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. So the Heavenly Father also testifies to Jesus' identity. But then he makes this dramatic statement, you have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Keep in mind, he is speaking to the religious authorities. And he's saying, not only are you, are you clueless, you don't 
You've never heard the voice of the Father. His word doesn't dwell in you, and you do not receive the one he has sent. Jesus, I mean, these are fighting words. Jesus is just, he is turning the apple cart over here. And then he makes this dramatic statement, and this is where we're going to end tonight, verses 39 and 40. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. As a kid in confirmation class, I had to memorize John chapter 5, verse 39, and I had to memorize it in the King James Version of the Bible that we used at that time many years ago. And the way the King James Version translates this is, search the scriptures. That was the verse that we were taught in confirmation class. Search the scriptures. And the implication was, you need to be in the Bible because you, you need to search those scriptures. But those words are lifted out of their context. And in their context, they are even more dramatic. Now, please do not get me wrong and please do not misunderstand me. I believe it is absolutely essential for believers to be in God's word, in the Bible. But I also believe it is absolutely essential for us to understand that we worship not the book, but the author. And what matters is not simply to know Bible stories and to know certain doctrines and to be able to speak biblical truth. What matters is to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to understand that it is only through him that you and I have eternal life and that we are to live in relationship with him and that it is only through him that we can hear the Father's voice. Jesus says, you do you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it's they that testify to me. And he is saying to these individuals who have been pouring over the scriptures for years, for decades, what is he saying? You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. In other words, you can be able to spout Bible passages, you can know biblical truths, you can understand Bible stories, but if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter. And it means nothing. It is all about Jesus. It is all about knowing Him and trusting Him and following Him and understanding that in Him is life. That by calling on him, by repenting and believing in him, as the scripture says, I have life now. Not just in the future, but it starts right now. And if I have not come into a relationship with him, but know all of the Bible truths, it doesn't mean a thing. In fact, it just makes my condition worse because I end up with a haughty, prideful attitude that I know the Bible. But again, it's not knowing the book, it's knowing the author. Please understand me, the book is important. You and I need to be in the Word, and we need that all the time. But of paramount importance is knowing the one who wrote the book, knowing the one who speaks the truth, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Father. That is the Holy Spirit. We want to know him, to hear his voice, to follow him. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. And that's where we have to stop. Because A, our time is up. B, that's where we stopped this morning. <laughs> and C, well, C, next week we'll get to go on from there okay let's close with a word of prayer and then we're going to shut things down and we'll open it up for comments and questions heavenly father we we declare you as our savior our god and our lord we honor you as the king of the universe as the one who did not spare his only son but gave him up for us all as the one whose Holy Spirit leads us to faith and transforms and renews us from within. We are in awe of you, Lord. May your word take ever deeper root in each one of our lives.
May we come to know you more and more, follow you more and more faithfully, and yearn for the day of your final appearing. We thank you for these words of our Savior that speak so powerfully and directly to each of us. May these words draw us ever more to you. May your Holy Spirit be poured out upon us in increasing measure in the days to come, that in all things you may have the glory, and may we may honor you. Amen.